for today, Mike Moyle was uh, born in the Big Island of Hawaii and has been a Sausalito resident for over 40 years. Until his retirement in 2013, he was a partner in an international law firm based in San Francisco and specialized in the United States and Japan business transaction. After he retired, he became active <clears throat> with local history, primarily through membership in the Sausalito Historical Society. And though not of Portuguese dis descent, as the head of the History Committee at the Sausalito Portuguese Cultures, Cultural Center. Most recently, recently, he has been collaborating with West Marin historian Dewey Livingston, working to identify all of the dairies, past and present, that have operated in Marin County. And so that's the subject of our discussion today, and he'll spend a little time uh, focusing on some of the dairies here in the Ross Valley. So please welcome Mike Moyle. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and uh, very glad to be here this morning. And thank you also for accommodating me. Um, I know this is generally a first Friday presentation and it's Thursday, so here we are. Uh, I thought I would start uh, this morning by just talking a little bit about how I got to this particular point. I think if you had asked me a few years ago whether I'd be giving a talk about dairies, uh, I would have said you are nuts, but um, here we are. Um, as Richard said, I uh, got involved with the Portuguese Cultural Center here in Sausalito uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, actually through the sister city relationship that Sausalito was developing at that time with the city of Cascais uh, in Portugal. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Cultural Center, this is a shot of it on Caledonia Street here in Sausalito. Uh, the, it was established in 1888, so it's actually older than Sausalito itself. The formal name is the IDESST, which is a acronym for a Portuguese, excuse me, the Portuguese name of it. Um, but uh, today we generally refer to it as the Portuguese Cultural Center. Here in Southern uh, Marin, um, almost all of the uh, Portuguese who came from Portugal uh, came from the Azores, uh, the group of nine islands that are quite a ways off the Portuguese uh, coast. And among those nine islands, uh, almost all of the Portuguese who came here to uh, California came from the three islands of Fayal, Picu, and Sao Jorge or St. George. And from those three, really, the bulk, at least here in the Sausalito area, came from the one island of St. George or Sao Jorge, which is this dagger of an island, not really that large, but for reasons that we still are not completely sure of, about 70% of those who came here to, to Sau the Sausalito area in the late 1800s uh, were from this one island. The Portuguese first came here to California uh, largely on American or uh, New England whaling ships. And uh, the whaling ships the, would come out of uh, New England. Generally, they would stop in the Azores initially, and then they would go on on their voyage, uh, ultimately out into the Pacific and up here to California. Uh, they picked up a number of crew members over the years, and we're talking about voyages going back to the 1700s initially. Um, but Azorians were uh, eager to join them. And that's why as it ends up today, there are uh, a concentration of uh, folks of Portuguese descent uh, in the New England area, in Hawaii, and then here in California as well. Uh, when they came into the Bay Area, this we're probably talking about the earliest around the 1830s or 1840s, they would come to Sausalito uh, to pick up water and lumber for uh, repairs to the ships. And so uh, that area of Southern uh, Sausalito uh, was called Whaler's Cove. And we have a view here, what it looked like in the late 1800s. And it's likely that the first Portuguese to land uh, in uh, Marin may very well have been there on the beach in Whaler's Cove. 
I got involved with the Portuguese uh, Cultural Center uh, in 2014. One of the first things I did uh, was, because they did not have a very good uh, set of historical materials, was to help develop uh, with the Sausalito uh, Historical Society a, a guide a walking tour through Sausalito out into Tennessee Valley, which focused on a number of uh, points that were of uh, relevance to the Portuguese heritage here. Uh, this book is available, the guidebook is available online at the Portuguese Cultural Center's uh, website. Uh, but one thing uh, I initially learned as working on that book, which I had really not known living here in Sausalito for many years before, was that there were a few dairies around and that those, the dairies that I initially did research on uh, in Tennessee Valley and out in the headlands, uh, there had been some Portuguese involved with them. Uh, as it turned out, as I got more involved with the Portuguese uh, Cultural Center, for those of you who have been there, you may be familiar with their annual uh, Holy Spirit Festival, sometimes called the Chamarita. Um, and at that festival, traditionally, going, now we're going back to the uh, late 1800s and into the early 1900s, the uh, ranchers at the dairies would donate cattle and those cattle would be driven into Sausalito uh, uh, in a group. And these are actually a couple of pictures. This is on Filbert Street uh, here in Sausalito, uh, probably in the early 1900s. And this is actually Caledonia and Pine Street. And they would drive the cattle in and they would drive them down the street. Then they would drive them over to the a, a, um, a little corral and um, barn that was owned by the, uh, the Paul over on Alima Street. Uh, where they would auction them off. That was a way to uh, raise money for the hall. They would auction a few of them off and then the rest would uh, meet a different fate. And then ultimately, for those of you who have uh, been at one of the, uh, the, fest the, the festas, as they're called, the festivals, uh, these would be converted into the sopash dish, which is the uh, traditional meal uh, served uh, at the festa. So this was a very important uh, connection between the dairies uh, and the Portuguese community as a whole. And then I began to do a little bit more research and I realized that it hadn't just been a little group of dairies in Tennessee Valley, but there had been quite a few more Portuguese dairies here in Southern Marin. And this is a map showing roughly where those dairies were located. Uh, now we'll see that elsewhere in Marin, of course, there are many more dairies, but here in Southern Marin, they were almost exclusively Portuguese. In other parts of Marin, there were uh, certainly Portuguese operating them as well, but there was quite a bit more diversity in the places from which the dairymen had, came, had come. And then of course you get up into uh, 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 West Marin and you have a similar phenomena with the group that came from the Swiss canton of Ticino, the Swiss Italian uh, group there. But I probably would have stopped uh, there in my work, but I met Dewey Livingston. And not only did I meet Dewey, but I realized how much work that he had already done uh, in terms of the history of the dairies uh, in Marin County. Not only had he done work on it, uh, he had written all these books about it and uh, these are all books that Dewey has written initially in connection with the Park Service regarding the Point Reyes Peninsula, the Olima Valley, and then more recently in connection with our local historical societies, uh, Nicasio, and then with the Ketfield and Green Bay group on the, in the Heart of Marin book, uh, which is perhaps the one that's most relevant to our talk today. But Dewey has been both an incredible resource, a mentor, a friend, um, and frankly, should be the one who's giving this presentation. And he's also uh, done a, a number of these oral histories uh, for the Marin Resource Conservation District, uh, including uh, the Cordas, the Dolcinis, the Grossis, the Mendozas, and the McDonald's. And so uh, obviously just an incredible wealth of information about dairies. 
So Dewey and I sat down one day and we said, well, well, I wonder how many dairies there were. And we put our heads together. And uh, and from that, was, that was from the point that we uh, decided to try and identify all the dairies. And that's the what we call the Marin Dairy Project. Now, this is a screenshot of a, a map that we uh, created on Google Maps that show the location of all of the dairies. This is going back a couple of years that we were able to identify at that time. And when we say the location, we mean generally where the barns uh, were located. So I think there were about 330 uh, dairies that we had identified at that time when we kind of went public uh, with this project and shared uh, this map and some other materials uh, online. Um, since then, we have, uh, through help from, from many others, including Richard and others at the, uh, uh, the Ross Historical Society, identified a number of additional dairies. And so we're now up to probably about 385 that we've identified throughout the county. And that comes out to about a dairy for every two square miles, which isn't really surprising. It's surprising when you look at it from today's perspective, but around 1870 or so, Marin was the largest dairy producer in the state of California, of the counties of California. So there is this long and incredibly rich uh, dairy tradition. And as you can see, dairies were literally everywhere in the county, I think, except with perhaps the slopes of Mount Tam. Uh, there's not a place you can go in Marin where you would be more than a mile or so from a dairy that operated at some point. Of course, not all of them operated at every at the same time. And uh, I hope that several of you had a chance to uh, listen to Brian Crawford's uh, talk a while back uh, about the shipwreck submarine. I thought I would give you an opportunity to win my bar bet uh, here as to whether Marin had more shipwrecks or dairies. For those of you who uh, attended Brian's talk, I believe he said that there were 330 shipwrecks that he had identified. So the correct answer as to uh, which there were more of would be dairies, of course. Now, when we talk about dairies, uh, generally we're, our criterion is really any operation that is selling uh, selling milk or dairy products, uh, and we're talking about cows, dairy products to the, the public. Uh, and when we get down to the dairy ownership, the history of the dairies here in Marin is that, of course, there was the real estate that was owned by a group of individuals, which would include the land and the uh, buildings. And then there would be uh, the movables, uh, the cattle themselves and the equipment. So in many cases, when we refer to the dairy operators, we're referring to the people who not necess don't necessarily own the land, but would own the cattle and the equipment. And the relevance for our project is that it's very difficult often to identify who those actual operators were. The real estate records in terms of land ownership are, are relatively available but the information as to who, who operated the dairies is, can be a little bit more elusive. And that also includes, now we're going further back to the 1800s and early 1900s, there were often informal partnerships that uh, formed uh, among individuals. So on any one dairy, you may have had two or three or four uh, individuals who each contributed some capital, perhaps, really just capital on the hoof, the, the cows themselves, and received a partnership share uh, in the dairy operations. And those uh, partnerships were extremely fluid. People would come and go uh, across the county with uh, taking their herds uh, with them over time. So this history of dairies in Marin is sort of a little bit of a sad one in terms of the trend. Uh, and these are not real estimates, but around 1900, we estimate that there were probably 300 or so dairies operating uh, in the county. Uh, that number has declined, uh, declined steadily in the uh, 20th century. Um, and today, I think the count is 20. 
uh, cow milk dairies uh, that are uh, remaining. This was a map that the um, malt organization had prepared in 2018 uh, showing the uh, remaining dairies at that time. Uh, since then, uh, we've lost uh, five uh, more uh, cow milk uh, dairies. There are a couple of other dairies here, goat, sheep, water buffalo as well. But generally today, we're down to 20 dairies. And you know, frankly, the, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, trends that are against uh, dairy operators. Uh, it's a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, job. Um, and they're uh, holding on as, uh, as best they can. But the advent of alternative milks, uh, uh, the costs of operation, environmental issues, um, labor uh, uh, challenges, um, and others have all uh, resulted in a significant decline in the numbers uh, here in Marin. So turning to the Ross Valley, the history of the Ross Valley, I'm afraid there are no dairies in the Ross Valley today. Um, but going back in time, we're going to look at a area that was uh, in the past at the time of the, of the Mexican uh, uh, history of California, uh, where two of the uh, historic ranchos uh, comprise what today we call the Ross Valley. The Cañada de Herrera, which was granted to Domingo Saiz in 1840, and the Punta de Quinton, which was granted to John Cooper in 1840. And so if you look at a map of Marin today, this is roughly the area we're talking about uh, when we refer to the Ross Valley. And so these are the dairies that uh, we've identified so far uh, in the Ross uh, Valley. Um, if you were to go back and look at our that map that Dewey and I had originally come up with, I think we only had 10 dairies at that time in this area. So over the last couple of years, we've added to that. We have now uh, 21 dairies identified here, which is about 6% of the total uh, that we've identified in uh, Marin uh, County as a whole. And by Ross Valley, this is really this handy dandy little map is the Ross Valley, the watershed, uh, which is a map that is put out by the, uh, uh, the, the Marin County water folks. And this shows of those 21 dairies, the decades uh, within which uh, they operated over the years. And so as you can see, the, the bulk of them were in here, the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Interestingly, the two that operated the longest and that we do include as dairies were the Presbyterian Orphanage uh, in San Anselmo and San Quentin Prison, uh, which had its own dairy uh, operation for internal use. Both of those uh, operations uh, went into the 1960s. And we are also aware that there were dairies which existed uh, with, uh, throughout the county that we haven't really included because we only include dairies where we can make a fairly good um, a guess about the, the location of where the, da where the dairy structures uh, were. And this was uh, a dairy that Dewey had uh, researched, the E. Berry Dairy, which was um, active in the 1870s. Uh, Mr. Berry appears on the scene when he bought this uh, milk route from Mr. Traxler in 1874. You know, he's advertising his milk uh, at the end of that year. And in 1876, seems like he's going out of business because he's selling the stock. In 1877, he's off for Humboldt uh, County. So somewhere around Ross Landing, uh, the E. Berry Dairy existed. And Unfortunately, uh, we probably will never find uh, where that one uh, was, and there are probably another 20 or 30 that are in this same category. Which is why we always love to give talks like this, because uh, the best way at this point that we have to identify dairies is often family histories, you know, pictures, historic pictures that people may have and so forth. So we encourage people to come forward with any information they may have about uh, dairies that may have existed in the past. 
the uh, history of transportation, of course, was a major factor in terms of the growth of the dairies here in Marin. The original dairies in Marin County were, as Dewey has really done a tremendous amount of research on, out in the Point Reyes area. So those dairies, when they began to operate, uh, were not able to get fresh milk products into San Francisco. So they would have to uh, produce primarily butter, which would then be able to be brought in by schooner uh, from uh, Drake's Bay into San Francisco. Uh, but uh, in 18, and those would go back to the 1850s, uh, 1873, uh, the North Pacific Coast Railroad established its line running from Sausalito up to uh, Sonoma. And so that was um, the line that comes up here through the, the Ross Valley, this blue line here, the yellow stars showing the stations. And that was a tremendous boon for dairy production. You could both then uh, produce butter, but you also had the opportunity to uh, produce uh, fresh dairy products that could be shipped into San Francisco by rail. And for uh, rail uh, historians, I would just note that this line shows the line that would have gone through the Alto Tunnel in 1873 when the North Pacific Coast Railroad started. The line actually came up along the Strawberry Peninsula and kind of closer up over the um, where the um, uh, Route 101 comes over from Mill Valley over to Corte Madeira and then into Larkspur. So this map is not completely correct in that regard. And then it also shows the 1884 extension of the San Francisco and North Pacific Railroad from San Rafael down into Tiburon. Ultimately, those were the became the Northwest Pacific uh, when it was consolidated. But rail uh, be, was a very important factor for uh, the dairies uh, here in Marin County. Now, uh, this was actually a photo uh, just showing the production. This was a, about 1892 out in the Tennessee Valley, the Cunha Dairy which is on the location where the Miwok stables are today, for those of you familiar with Tennessee Valley. But one of the descendants of the Cunha family just shared this photo with us a few weeks ago. And it's, it's the oldest photo we've ever seen of milkers out there or actual dairy operations. But as you can see in the early days, uh, when they would milk the, uh, the cows, it was primarily outdoors. Um, and the milkers would have these stools that were actually uh, strapped onto them, onto their bottoms, so they could move between the cows. Um, needless to say, that was not the most sanitary operation. Um, milk would be, if it was going to be distributed uh, just locally, primarily, would it be brought around likely in wagons, uh, in milk pails, and then distributed to local customers. This was a quote from uh, Hervey Thatcher, the inventor of one of the early milk bottles. He said that, uh, and this was, he was quoting a, uh, a early dairyman back on the East Coast who would deliver milk. He said, he, he said when he started to deliver milk in the morning, the cream would rise to the top, in the dip can, so that the first customer served got a surplus of cream. And as he each time removed the cover, some dirt from the street and some hair from the horses would sift into the milk so that when he reached the last customers, they were served skim milk with all kinds of foreign matter that had sifted in while on his route. So cleanliness was not the number one uh, uh, priority of those early dairymen. And of course, there was a good deal of uh, disease that was associated, tuberculosis primarily, was associated with uh, raw milk uh, delivery in the early days. So sanitation has been a, a growing trend uh, in the industry, which also impacted the way in which dairies operated. Another factor is the uh, just the distribution of milk. This is a uh, chart that's too small really to see, but just here in Marin, it's kind of interesting to see how milk was delivered to customers 
back in, in the 1800s, uh, likely that milk would have been delivered by those uh, wagons coming by, coming at your front door. Uh, the early, earliest uh, significant operation was the Roberts Dairy uh, that was in San Rafael. They had a number of dairies that, and then would uh, supply milk to the San Rafael area. In uh, 1918, the Marin County Milk Company uh, was formed by the consolidation of three smaller dairies. George Alpers, who went on to become San Rafael's uh, mayor, was involved with that. Uh, they were acquired in 1930 by Borden. 1933, Frank Grady established the Lucas Valley Dairy in San Rafael. That became a very substantial dairy. They actually are today are uh, what has become the Clover brand. So you had Golden State took over Roberts, Borden's took over Marin County Milk, and Clover had took over the Lucas Valley. Uh, but uh, you will see that there was just this gradual consolidation, which again limited the opportunities for individual dairies, and again a factor in the reduction of the overall number over the years. So we'll now just talk about uh, four specific dairies uh, of the 21 that we identified earlier uh, here in um, the, the Ross, uh, Ross Valley. We'll start with Sleepy Hollow, which is, uh, we'll start here in each of them. We'll take a look first at a Google Earth uh, image uh, showing the location of the dairy. This is uh, Sir Francis Drake coming along here and then Butterfield Road, which comes up through Sleepy Hollow. Uh, and then San Domenico School is way up here. And uh, this yellow square here shows the map on the right. And so the yellow star is again, the location of the Sleepy, Sleepy Valley or Sleepy Hollow uh, Dairy. And then uh, we have a more detailed map here so showing that the dairy was located right here where Kat Katrina Lane intersects with Butterfield uh, Road uh, today. And this is what the dairy uh, looked like back in the day. And beautiful, just a beautiful dairy. Uh, and a lovely, lovely uh, location. And this kind of shows the timeline of the dairy operation. The dairy operation started there on that location in 1853, uh, when Pedro Saez leased the land to Harvey Butterfield who started the dairy. It then went through a number of different operators over the years. The Delessi uh, brothers uh, who had come from Switzerland uh, were early operators and Frank Dennis uh, from the Azores uh, came in. And then uh, the most probably significant operator was Sig Herzog, who another dairy operator who went on to become San Rafael uh, mayor. He uh, uh, leased the dairy uh, from Richard Hodling and uh, spent a lot of uh, effort and money in uh, improving the quality of the operation and actually established what was then known as a certified milk company. Uh, which had to meet certain sanitary uh, regulations. But in 1925, I guess they were going to uh, sell the property. So the Herzogs then ended up purchasing uh, land up in the Lakeville Highway in Petaluma, and they moved the Sleepy Hollow Dairy up there. So if you go up there to the Lakeville Highway, you'll find the Sleepy Hollow or a dairy called a Sleepy Hollow Dairy that's there today. And after that, uh, another uh, Azorian named Joseph Fagundish uh, came in, took over the dairy, uh, but he used the Sleepy Valley name because Sig Herzog had actually acquired the rights to the Sleepy Hollow name. Um, and Joseph Fagundish operated it until 1942. During the war, the army decided it was going to build a ammunition storage depot there. So uh, Joseph uh, ended up moving his dairy operation out to the Whitegate Ranch area on Stinson Beach, and that was the that was the <clears throat> end of the dairy operations uh, there. But uh, we do have examples of two of the bottles: one from the Herzog period with Sleepy Hollow, 
and one from the Fagundish period when it became uh, Sleepy Valley. Uh, another resource for our um, research has been uh, milk bottle collectors uh, because they often have uh, bottles with names of the dairies and sometimes uh, that helps us in identifying the dairies. So if there are any milk bottle collectors on, uh, the, on the call this morning, we appreciate your help in identifying the dairies here. Now, not all dairies, of course, uh, use milk bottles, and so only a fraction of the ones that uh, we've identified would actually have milk bottles uh, for their, their operations. This is what uh, the area looks like today. These are pictures, again, of the dairy as it existed, and a shot I took a few days ago up on the ridge here, looking down into the Sleepy uh, Hollow. This is uh, Loma Alta up here, San Domenico School would be here, and the old dairy would have been right about here. The new, all this foliage that's grown up over the years does not make uh, dairy research any easier. So now we're going to move a little further uh, south to the Spagnoli Sorich Dairy. Uh, which was located at the end of San Francisco Boulevard, which comes off of San Sir Francis Drake here in San Anselmo, all the way up to the end of the hill. Again, you can see the location right up to today, part of Sorch Park. The dairy operation was where the yellow star was and where the cow is. This is a view of uh, aerial view from above uh, Butterfield Road here, we're above Sleepy Hollow, looking down towards San Anselmo and uh, south. This is uh, Sir Francis Drake going out here, and the Sleepy, uh, the uh, Sfagundish, sorry, Sorich uh, Spagnoli Dairy was right here in that yellow square at the end of uh, San Francisco Boulevard. The uh, cemetery is over here at Red Hill, right here. This is a view looking down uh, San Francisco Boulevard to Sir Francis Drake would be down here. Um, and you can see the, uh, this one at this point, 1947 would have been the storage dairy right here in the lower left corner. This was the hay barn. And then this was the actual milking barn and creamery uh, here. Here's a little different view. This is a Google Earth shot from today. If you drive up there today, this is the um, San Anselmo City Corporation Yard or Town Corporation Yard. And then there is a parking area up here. This the Port Corporation Yard is where the old hay barn was. And then the creamery and uh, milking barn was up here where the parking lot is uh, today. So uh, the actual dairy operation on that specific site, we believe, was begun by the Spagnolis. The Spagnolis were an Italian couple that came from the area uh, about 40 miles east of Genova in Parma in Italy. And they actually came here in the early part of the 1900s. And Luisa uh, supposedly started her dairying. She bought two cows, walked out from San Rafael to Bolinas, bought a couple of cows and brought them back to uh, San Rafael on foot. But um, they actually moved to that location at the end of San Francisco Boulevard in 1917 and began their dairy operations there at that time. Um, in 1945, uh, Nick Nicholas Sorich, who had been born uh, in what was then Austria, later became Yugoslavia, and today is Croatia, um, purchased the dairy business uh, and the herd from the Spagnolis and continued the operations himself until 1953 when he went out of the dairy business and sold out his dairy mm, uh, route, I guess you would say, to Lu Lucas Valley Dairy. So, uh, Lucas Valley became sort of the successor to the uh, that operation. But we do have a couple of uh, bottles, the San Anselmo Dairy, which would have been from the Spagnoli's period, and then both Nick's Dairy and So Rich, or So Rich, uh, from the Nick So Rich uh, period. 
And this is a view today. I uh, went down there a few days ago and took this picture. And again, you can see the Corporation Yard buildings here and the San Francisco Boulevard going out uh, uh, to um, Sir Francis Drake as it looks today. And very happily, I was standing up here in the, the open land of Sorch Ranch, which has been preserved as open land, uh, but was originally part of the, the dairy uh, facility. The third uh, dairy we're gonna look at is a little bit of an unusual one. Um, it was operated uh, by a gentleman named John Mullenkamp uh, and was on the Kent estate uh, in Kentfield. So here's uh, Sir Francis Drake going up here through Kent Kentfield College of Marin, uh, College Avenue coming down here. And then the dairy would have been about here. And then this is a blow up here coming up Woodland Road. If you come up Woodland Road and you get to uh, Laurel Way, the dairy would have been right on the right. Impossible to identify that location as a dairy uh, today. But the dairy was located on the Kent uh, estate there in, uh, in Kentfield, uh, what is Kentfield today. Uh, this is a view of uh, the Kent estate looking down uh, towards uh, Larkspur uh, from Ross Hill. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful shot. And of course, one, I, I, I think you'd need a drone to take anything near this picture uh, today. And it would be unrecognizable because of, of course, all of the, the foliage. This was about 1880. Now, the Kents, and this is Albert and Adeline, um, the original Kents, uh, who purchased uh, the property in the 1800s. Uh, initially, the Kent family had a small dairy operation just of their own to supply their family needs, probably just a few cows. But uh, in around 1920 or so, uh, they uh, made an arrangement with a gentleman named John Mullenkamp to operate uh, a small dairy uh, on the Kent estate. And so I'm sure he provided milk to the family, but then he also had uh, this business where he delivered milk in the, the local area uh, to uh, regular customers. This is a wonderful photo uh, that dates back to uh, 1923. That is an aerial photo showing uh, the Kent estate and it's um, uh, particularly noteworthy because it has these annotations all around the border of the photo that uh, we understand were uh, done by Ann, Ann Kent, uh, for whom the Auntie Kent California Room is named. Um, and it shows the Kent estate, but it also shows over here in the, the yellow square, uh, what was the cow barn. This, this building that was right here. This is a blow up of it on the right, the cow barn. And then they also had a beautiful uh, carriage uh, stable for the horses. And you could see, you could tell it was the cow barn because all of these cow uh, paths were coming up from the fields and converging here at the barn. So this is the barn that John Mullenkamp would have used for the milking and then this was apparently his residence uh, just up here. Today, uh, this, this structure remains, it's a, now a private residence that was remodeled, uh, but the cow barn is unfortunately uh, gone. Um, but this is south and north is up this way here. You can see we put the, um, the photo uh, juxtaposed on the Google Earth image and with a lot of help from uh, Richard Tarney and uh, uh, others we were able to uh, figure out exactly where it fits here. So this would be the barn would have been uh, right here, which is we said on Woodside. And we even have a uh, milk bottle from John Mullenkamp, uh, John Mullenkamp, Kentfield, California. And uh, I, read, I meant to ask uh, Dewey this uh, before, but John Mullenkamp may have been the only Dutch uh, dairyman who ever operated dairy in Marin County. I'm not 
completely sure of that, but we do happen to know that he came from this town called, I think it's called Odenzaal uh, in the Netherlands. So our final dairy we're going to look at today is one of my favorites because we have such wonderful photos of it. It's the Green Bray Dairy, which is uh, located right here, just across from the shopping center. Uh, this is Sir Francis Drake uh, coming down uh, here. Star right here. I don't know, is it Elysio or Eliseo Drive coming up here from Sir Francis Drake, where it's about the intersection with Brentano Way. Uh, was where the Green Braid Dairy uh, was located. And we have a shot of it here. This is uh, 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 from an aircraft flying just south of Sir Francis Drake here. This would have probably been in the 40s or uh, so. And you can see 101 coming up the hill over here. You can even see that the old before they put in the new Sir Francis Drake, this is the old route that came along here, skirting the marsh there. But this was the dairy up here, right at the end of the, the road coming up. And this is a blow up of it over on the right. Uh, you can see the, the barn, barn structure here. And then this is this same area uh, today from a, a Google Earth uh, view, approximately the same area, a few more houses. Uh, up there over the years. Another view of it, this is a ground view um, from uh, looking at it from Sir Francis Drake. And then you can see here the barn structure. So this picture was probably taken from about this spot over here on the hill, looking towards, towards the barn and up the hill. And of course, these lovely cows you know, grazing down here. So uh, this dairy, the Green Bray Dairy, was probably the one that operated for the longest continual period in uh, the Ross Valley. Uh, in 1860s, uh, James Ross uh, established it. Um, there were again some Swiss Italians that were uh, operated uh, the dairy for a while. Uh, the Felos, the Donutis, the Tomasinis uh, were there. 1910, uh, or in 1890, uh, the property was uh, purchased by the Archdiocese of San Francisco uh, with the intention of building a seminary on the location, but at least we're fortunate for dairy historians, that didn't happen. So the property continued to be used as a dairy for several more years. Uh, a, uh, a Zorian named Manuel Teixeira, that came in uh, 1910, and he operated the dairy there for 27 years. Then after him, a gentleman named Manuel Betancourt, also from the Azores. Betancourt is a very common uh, Azorian uh, name. Uh, he leased it um, probably until around 1945 or 46 when the dairy operations uh, ceased on that location. And I just wanted to mention another incredible resource that we have uh, for dairy uh, research, but of interest to uh, folks who have a history here in Marin. One of the other um, milk distribution companies that was active in the, probably starting in the 1930s, was a company called Marin Dell. Um, I didn't mention it in connection earlier uh, with the, um, milk distribution uh, firms because Marindell didn't sell directly to consumers. Uh, it sold uh, to supermarkets, um, but it uh, purchased milk from many uh, dairies uh, within Marin and Sonoma County. Around 1950, for reasons that we don't know, they de decided that they would create a kind of a history of the producers of who were supplying Marindell at that time, all of the dairies that were supplying Marindell, uh, of which there were about 50 in Marin County and a number more in Sonoma. So for each of those producers, they uh, um, took a number of photos of the dairy and then they wrote this uh, history 
of the family. Usually uh, this would go anywhere from one to five pages and sometimes more uh, detailing the history, just incredible uh, information. So for Manuel Teixeira, who I mentioned was operated the Green Braid Dairy, uh, we have his history of his comings and goings in Marin County and his history is not all that uncommon for the other histories that are reported. Uh, and I mention it here because it shows how often people moved. I said earlier that uh, people moved often between dairy operators moved and they certainly did. Teixeira started off in Sausalito around 1889. He then found an opportunity out in Point Reyes. He moved uh, over to Tennessee, back to Tennessee Valley and Sausalito. From there, he moved back to Point Reyes. From there, he moved back to Tennessee Valley. He then went up to the Chapman Ranch, which was out in Nicasio, then up to Loma Alta, then over to, finally, he got to Greenbrae in 1910, stayed there for 27 years, and then moved up to the Miller Ranch up uh, in, um, San, Northern San Rafael, uh, which he they actually was able to finally purchase the property. Until then, he had been leasing property, but he purchased that property, and that property was ultimately developed into what a Marinwood is today. So, for those of you who are at all interested, this is an incredible resource, and the entire volumes there are two volumes of it are available on the uh, the Novato um, Historical Guilds uh, website. Another resource, just a, a shout out to the folks at the uh, Antique Kent uh, California Room Map Annex. Uh, one of the fellows who works there, Parker Pringle, has created what he calls the Marin Historical Maps and Imagery uh, file, which is a set of uh, resources, uh, largely images and others that are, uh, he's incorporated into the Google Earth app and so um, you have, you can use Google Earth. And so this is an image again, showing the Green Braid area. And then you go over and you click on it and it'll show you that exact same spot with the uh, historical aerial map. So you, know, you can go back and forth, use the, the tool that allows you to bring the images back and forth. And it's just an incredible way for us to be able to really pinpoint <clears throat> where various features, barns and for these dairies and so forth uh, were located. And this is, uh, there was a uh, 1931 aerial flight, which uh, this is a photo of showing the area from 1931. Not such a hot image there, but you can enhance it quite a bit. And so this again is the Green Braid Dairy on May 19, 1931. So I think if you look just to the left here, you can see Manuel Teixeira waving at us from uh, just uh, next to the, the barn there. But you can see the incredible detail with the fields uh, that have been harvested here for hay um, and so forth. For those who are interested, these maps, these photographs, these aerial photographs, uh, are available. There's an incredible collection on the Santa Barbara Library's uh, website, uh, aerial photography. This that was just one of the images taken on 1931. All of the, every one of these red dots is a picture that was taken by this May 19, 1931 flight coming up here along uh, route, what is today 101. Again, I uh, encourage you if you're interested at all to take a look at the, that site. So I'll just end here with this wonderful photo, uh, looking at uh, across uh, the uh, Green Bray area up towards um, Mount Tam. Now, Richard Turney um, claims that he got permission from a homeowner to take uh, this picture um, not too long ago, which is a lovely photo and almost exactly the previous one. But Richard went up there and took this shot uh, with a wonderful then and now. We can even add a little color onto it and just uh, shows you that even notwithstanding the foliage, uh, if you have uh, 
the right determination, you too can you know, get a, a pretty good shot comparable to the historical ones. And so I'd like to thank again, the uh, Ross Historical Society and, and really all of the historical societies here in Marin that have all been so helpful uh, to us uh, in connection uh, with uh, our project, Judy Coy and at the uh, uh, San Anselmo Society too, that was very helpful for this specific uh, talk as well. Um, and um, thank you and uh, I'd be happy to try to address any questions that anybody may have. And if anybody has any, would like to contact me in the future, feel free to use this email address uh, as well. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, for thank that. You, Mike. That was great. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, yes, we're, we're now open. If anybody wants to ask a question of Mike, uh, just use the chat or the Q&A feature that Zoom has. Uh, if you would like to raise your hand, I can bring you in and uh, you, can, you can talk to Mike, uh, ask questions. Uh, um, <clears throat> actually, while, while people are uh, putting out questions, I see we have a few, but you're, while you were speaking, Mike, I, I remembered when I was growing up in Ross in the 70s, we used to have our milk and our dairy products delivered by a milkman. Um, right. and, uh, and maybe that had something, maybe given all the dairies in the area. Uh, I remember his name was Fred, Fred the milkman. <laughs> Anybody who grew up in Ross probably knew him because he served Ross and would bring us milk and ice cream and everything else uh, once or twice a week. Uh, well, I, I know that I know that if you want to ever hit the nostalgia button, there's a, a Facebook group that people are probably familiar with called Lost Marin. And if, if you ever ask a question or share something about uh, milk delivery, you know, your, your local milkman from back in the day, that will, I guarantee you, that will generate hundreds of comments of people <laughs> sharing stories about their local milkman. I, <laughs> you're right. I mean, obviously that was, that was, I think all of us who grew up in an era when milk was delivered to your front door, you know, have a very, uh, very warm, warm memories of that. Yeah. I see, by the way, we had a couple of questions or comments that came in on the uh, chat. Uh, one says, I see no reference to the Silvera Ranch, which is still operating. Uh, that's correct. The Silvera still owned property. They actually had two ranches, one uh, just north of the Civic Center there, uh, across from Marinwood, and the second uh, ranch location just south of the Sonoma border off of 101. Unfortunately, the Silveras went out of the dairy operations just a few years ago. Uh, they were, uh, uh, are, they still, however, run cattle. Up, they have a heifer replacement program, but they are no longer, sadly, in the dairy business. I assume that's the Silvera Ranch that uh, Harold is referring to. And then uh, Tom Perry made a comment that the Green Braid Dairy started by James Ross in the 1860s was actually the son of James Ross Sr. James Ross Younger was a Marin County supervisor who died in office 1875. That is correct, of course. Uh, Let's see, the, <clears throat> there's a, well, we, we have some people saying great presentation, Mike. Thank you, this is fantastic. Lots of very kind accolades for you there. Um, oh, I see one about from uh, Moira Burke about the Smith Dairy. Yes, that is one that um, on our map, that dairy is identified as the Roy, Roy, R-O-Y uh, dairy. Um, and one of the things that Dewey and I unfortunately had to do is we had to pick a name for every dairy that we identified on our maps. And as you can see from the presentation, dairies that may have operated over 80 years would of course had many different names over those periods. So we often had to just pick one or two of the names. But Moira is correct that the Roy Dairy was uh, in its last stage as a dairy operated by the Smith brothers um, who also had a much larger dairy that was uh, down uh, 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 where Smith Ranch Road 
is today out at McGinnis Park. And they, so they actually operated two dairies in Marin County, one out in Marin, uh, McGinnis Park, and the second, which was the, where, the, where we identified as the Roy Dairy. Um, uh, they later um, kept that property when the, when the dairy operations there ended, they uh, conducted very well-known uh, rodeos uh, up there on their facilities. So the Smiths were certainly very actively involved uh, with the dairy operations uh, here in Marin. And Vince Trotter uh, 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 from the uh, UC Ag uh, folk, we get a lot of support from, from him. We appreciate their uh, assistance in identifying which dairies were still operating uh, today. If I could put a, a pitch in for real cow's milk, um, I think we can probably help uh, do a little bit to help uh, our local dairies simply by buying uh, milk from our local dairy producers, uh, Clover and Strauss Family Creamery, both uh, buy milk from dairies that are located in Marin County. And then of course, there are a few uh, that are have diversified into cheese today. Uh, so look for Marin County dairy cheeses and milk, please, in your local stores. <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate that plug, Mike. In fact, I'll, I'll even point out that I've got this uh, Strauss. I'm a big fan of the Strauss, the milk, the yogurt, er everything that they do, and, and uh, Point Reyes cheeses. And you can see a lot of that at farmer's markets that uh, are around Marin County, the local, the local producers are still at those. Uh, Tom Tom Perrot also asked a, a book in the offing. I'm I'm counting on Dewey. Anything that has to be written in book form will be coming from Dewey, but uh, I can't promise anything necessarily along those lines. Uh, I have to say that uh, it is one thing I do plan to do is to ultimately update the map that we have on the, uh, uh, that we have a Google map that we had shared in the past that we really haven't updated or I haven't updated over the last couple of years. So when we talk about the 385 dairies that we've identified, only about 330 actually show up on that map. That map does have some errors that people have pointed out that we will be correcting. Um, and so we will be doing that work uh, I'm not sure that we can promise a, a full-fledged book, though. Well, Mike, that's been great. Uh, I just want to point out that the Kentfield Greenbrae Historical Society was given a donation a number of years ago, and it's an old cowbell that one of the early residents in Greenbrae, when they were first building houses, had found up on the hills. It sounds like... <laughs> So that would have been the sound you'd hear around the hills in, in Green Bay in the early days. Thank you, Richie. You'll see in my, my photo here on the screen, uh, I go around to local schools and give a abbreviated version of this talk. Actually, it's even better because I usually take Portuguese sweet bread and cheese from the St. George cheesemakers uh, with me. But that's my sidekick that I take with me on my, my talks. And it has its own little bell. I'm afraid not as impressive as yours, though. <laughs> and and I might add, uh, you've re made reference to Dewey several times, and and Dewey is uh, in the audience today. He made a comment that uh, that uh, Ellen Strauss was from Holland, so the, oh. the Dutch uh, dairy women. There we go. Thank you, yeah. Dewey, for that that. Uh, we will have to we'll have to kind of correct that part of the presentation. <laughs> well, well, wonderful. Uh, yeah, we're a bit past noon, so we uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So I just uh, thank you so much, Mike, for this presentation. It's been a, a wonderful presentation, and it will be available. Uh, we are recording it, and it will be on our Ross Historical Society website. So check that out. Uh, it'll be available in about a day. Give me a chance to upload it, but it will be available. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Mike.